The letter written to the Jews by Lysias was to this effect. Lysias to the people of the Jews, greeting. John and Absalom, who were sent by you, have delivered your signed communication and have asked about the matters indicated therein. I have informed the king of everything that needed to be brought before him, and he has agreed to what was possible. If you will maintain your goodwill toward the government, I will endeavor for the future to help promote your welfare. And concerning these matters and their details, I have ordered these men and my representatives to confer with you. Farewell. The 148th year, Dioscorathenius 24th. The king's letter ran thus. King Antiochus to his brother Lysias, greeting. Now that our father has gone on to the gods, we desire that the subjects of the kingdom be undisturbed in caring for their own affairs. We have heard that the Jews do not consent to our father's change to Greek customs, but prefer their own way of living and ask that their own customs be allowed them. Accordingly, since we choose that this nation also be free from disturbance, our decision is that their temple be restored to them and that they live according to the customs of their ancestors. You will do well, therefore, to send word to them and give them pledges of friendship so that they may know our policy and be of good cheer and go on happily in the conduct of their own affairs. To the nation, the king's letter was as follows. King Antiochus to the Senate of the Jews and to the other Jews, greeting. If you are well, it is as we desire. We also are in good health. Menelaus has informed us that you wish to return home and look after, look after your own affairs. Therefore, those who go home by the 30, 30th day of Xanthicus will have our pledge of friendship and full permission for the Jews to enjoy their own food and laws, just as formerly, and none of them shall be molested in any way for what he may have done in ignorance. And I have also sent Menelaus to encourage you. Farewell. The 148th year, Xanthicus 15th. The Romans also sent them a letter, which read thus. Quintus Meminus and Titus Manius, envoys of the Romans, to the people of the Jews, greeting. With regard to what Lysias the kinsman of the king has granted you, we also give consent. But as to the matters which he decided are to be referred to the king, as soon as you have considered them, send someone promptly, so that we may make proposals appropriate for you. For we are on our way to Antioch. Therefore make haste and send some men, so that we may have your judgment. Farewell. The 148th year. Xanthicus 15th. When the agreement had been reached, Lysias returned to the king, and the Jews went about their farming. But some of the governors in various places, Timothy and Apollonius, the son of Gennaeus, as well as Hieronymus and Demophon, and in addition to these, Nicanor, the governor of Cyprus, would not let them live quietly and in peace. And some men of Joppa did so ungodly a deed as this. They invited the Jews who lived among them to embark with their wives and children on boats, which they had provided as though there, there were no ill will to the Jews. And this was done by public vote of the city. And when they accepted because they wished to live peaceably and suspected nothing, the men of Joppa took them out to sea and drowned them, not less than 200. When Judas heard of the cruelty visited on his countrymen, he gave orders to his men and calling upon God the righteous judge, attacked the murderers of his brethren. He set fire to the harbor by night and burned the boats and massacred those who had taken refuge there. Then because the city's gates were closed, he withdrew, intending to come again and root out the whole community of Joppa. But learning that the men in Jamnia meant in the same way to wipe out the Jews who were living among them, he attacked the people of Jamnia by night and set fire to the harbor and the fleet so that the glow of the night was seen in Jerusalem, 30 miles distant. When they had gone more than a mile from there, on their march against Timothy, not less than 5,000 Arabs with 500 horsemen attacked them. After a hard fight, Judas and his men won the victory by the help of God. The defeated nomads begged Judas to grant them pledges of friendship, promising to give them cattle and to help his people in all other ways. Judas, thinking that they might really be useful in many ways, agreed to make peace with them, and after receiving his pledges, they departed to their tents. 
He also attacked a certain city, which was strongly fortified with earthworks and walls, and inhabited by all sorts of Gentiles. Its name was Caspin. And those who were within, relying on the strength of the walls and on their supply of provisions, behaved most insolently toward Judas and his men, railing at them and even blaspheming and saying unholy things. But Judas and his men, calling upon the great sovereign of the world, who without battering rams or engines or war overthrew Jericho in the days of Joshua, rushed furiously upon the walls. They took the city by the will of God and slaughtered untold numbers, so that the adjoining lake, a quarter of a mile wide, appeared to be running over with blood. When they had gone ninety-five miles from there, they came to Chirax, to the Jews who are called Tubani. They did not find Timothy in that region, for he had by then departed from the region without accomplishing anything, though in one place he had left a very strong garrison. Dostheus and Sosipater, who were captains under Maccabeus, marched out and destroyed those whom Timothy had left in the stronghold, more than ten thousand men. But Maccabeus arranged his army in divisions, set men in command of the divisions, and hastened after Timothy, who had with him a hundred and twenty thousand infantry and two thousand five hundred cavalry. When Timothy learned of the approach of Judas, he sent off the women and the children and also the baggage to a place called Carnarim, for that place was hard to besiege and difficult of access because of the narrowness of all the approaches. But when Judas's first division appeared, terror and fear came over the enemy at the manifestation to them of him who sees all things, and they rushed off in flight and were swept on, this way and that, so that often they were injured by their own men and pierced by the points of their swords. And Judas pressed the pursuits with the utmost vigor putting the sinners to the sword, and destroyed as many as thirty thousand men. Timothy himself fell into the hands of Dostheus and Sosipater and their men. With great guile, he begged them to let him go in safety, because he held the parents of most of them and the brothers of some, and no consideration would be shown them. And when, with many words, he had confirmed his solemn promise to restore them unharmed, they let him go, for the sake of saving their brethren. Then Judas marched against Carnarim at the temple of Atargatis and slaughtered 25,000 people. After the rout and destruction of these, he marched also against Ephron, a fortified city where Lysias dwelt with multitudes of people of all nationalities. Stalwart young men took their stand before the walls and made a vigorous defense, and great stores of war engines and missiles were there. But the Jews called upon the sovereign, who with power shatters the might of his enemies, and they got the city into their hands, and killed as many as twenty-five thousand of those who were within it. Setting out from there, they hastened to Scythopolis, which is seventy-five miles from Jerusalem. But when the Jews who dwelt there bore witness to the goodwill which the people of Scythopolis had shown them, and their kind treatment of them in times of misfortune, they thanked them and exhorted them to be well disposed to their race in the future also. Then they went up to Jerusalem, as the Feast of Weeks was close at hand. After the feast called Pentecost, they hastened against Gorgias, the governor of Edomina. And he came out there with 3,000 infantry and 400 cavalry. When they joined battle, it happened that a few of the Jews fell. But a certain Dosotheus, one of Bacchanor's men, who was on horseback and was a strong man, caught hold of Gorgias, and grasping his cloak, was dragging him off by main strength, wishing to take the accursed man alive, when one of the Thracian horsemen bore down upon him and cut off his arm, so Gorgi Gorgias escaped and reached Marisa. As Edris and his men had been fighting for a long time and were weary, Judas called upon the Lord to, sh to show himself their ally and leader in the battle. In the language of their fathers, he raised the battle cry with hymns, when he charged against Gorgias's men when they were not expecting it and put them to flight. Then Judas assembled his army and went to the city of Adullam. As the seventh day was coming on, they purified themselves according to the custom, and they kept the Sabbath there. On the next day, as by that time it had become necessary, Judas and his men went to take up the bodies of the fallen 
and to bring them back to lie with their kinsmen in the sepulchres of their fathers. Then under the tunic of every one of the dead, they found sacred tokens of the idols of Jamnia, which the law forbids the Jews to wear. And it became clear to all that this was why these men had fallen. So they all blessed the ways of the Lord, the righteous judge, who reveals the things that are hidden. And they turned to prayer, begging that the sin which had been committed might be wholly blotted out. And the noble Judas exhorted the people to keep themselves free from sin, for they had seen with their own eyes what had happened because of the sin of those who had fallen. He also took up a collection, man by man, to the amount of two thousand drachmas of silver, and sent it to Jerusalem to provide for a sin offering. In doing this, he acted very well and honorably, taking account of the resurrection. For if he were not expecting that those who had fallen would, would rise again, it would have been super, superfluous and foolish to pray for the dead. But if he was looking to the splendid reward that is laid up for those who fall asleep in godliness, it was a holy and pious thought. Therefore he made atonement for the dead, that they might be delivered from their sin. I come to my garden, my sister, my bride. I gather my myrrh with my spice. I eat my honeycomb with my honey. I drink my wine with my milk. Eat, O friends, and drink. Drink deeply, O lovers. I sleep, but my heart was awake. Hark, my beloved is knocking. Open to me, my sister, my love, my dove, my perfect one. For my head is wet with dew, my locks with the drops of the night. I had put off my garment. How could I put it on? I had bathed my feet. How could I soil them? My beloved put his hand to the latch, and my heart was thrilled within me. I arose to open to my beloved, and my hands dripped with myrrh my fingers with liquid myrrh, upon the handles of the bolt. I opened to my beloved, but my beloved had turned and gone. My soul failed when he spoke. I sought him, but found him not. I called him, but he gave no answer. The watchmen found me, as they went about in the city. They beat me, they wounded me, they took away my mantle, those watchmen of the walls. I adjure you, O daughters of Jerusalem, if you find my beloved, that you tell him, I am sick with love. What is your beloved more than another beloved, O fairest among women? What is your beloved more than another beloved, that you thus adjure us? My beloved is all radiant and ruddy, distinguished among ten thousand. His head is the finest gold, his locks are wavy, black as a raven. His eyes are like doves, beside springs of water, bathed in milk, fitly set, his cheeks are like beds of spices, yielding fragrance. His lips are lilies, distilling liquid myrrh. His arms are rounded gold, set with jewels. His body is ivory work, encrusted with sapphires. His legs are alabaster columns, set upon bases of gold. His appearance is like Lebanon, choice as the cedars. His speech is most sweet, and he is altogether desirable. This is my beloved, and this is my friend, O daughters of Jerusalem. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain. And he seized the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years, and threw him into the pit, and shut it and sealed it over him, and that he should deceive the nations no more, till the thousand years were ended. After that he must be let out for a little while. Then I saw thrones, and seated on them were those to whom judgment was committed. Also I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their testimony to Jesus, and for the word of God, and who had not worshipped the beast or its image, and had not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life, and reigned with Christ a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he who shares in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and they shall reign with him a thousand years. And when the thousand years are ended, Satan will be released from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations which are at the four corners of the earth, that is, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. Their number is like the sand of the sea. 
and they marched up over the broad earth, and surrounded the camp of the saints, and the beloved city. But fire came down from heaven, and consumed them. And the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet were. And they will be tormented day and night for ever and ever. Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat upon it. From his presence earth and sky fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Also another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books, by what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead in, in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead in them. And all were judged by what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Judas Maccabeus, after fighting a battle, returns with his soldiers to bury the dead, which is one of the corporal works of mercy. He discovers, however, that each of his fallen soldiers is wearing pagan medals to give them luck. Of course, the opposite happened, as those wearing such idolatrous charms were precisely those who died. Judas then takes up a collection from his survivors to offer sin, sin offerings in the temple for atonement of the dead. Scripture observes the nobility and charity of praying for the dead. In doing this, he acted very well and honorably, taking account of the resurrection. For if he were not expecting that those who had fallen would rise again, it would have been superfluous and foolish to pray for the dead. But if he was looking to the splendid reward that is later for those who fell asleep in godliness, it was a holy and pious thought. Therefore, he made atonement for the dead, that they might be delivered from their sin. Do you act nobly like Judas Maccabeus and pray for the loved ones and friends in your life who have passed away? <laughs>